Hey, Celebration Church, it's Pastor Tim Timberlake, and today we're switching it up a little bit. Every now and again, I like to do these studio sermons where I can engage with you in your homes, in your cars, wherever you may be watching and leaning into today's message from, and I'm excited to continue part two. If you're watching this live, I want you to go ahead and share this and let people know we're on right now. I'll put it in the chats where you're watching from. And I can't wait to go on this journey with you of continuing our thought from Ephesians chapter 6. If you're in or out to Celebration Church, don't worry. We still have an in-person live services today and something special is happening. And so if you had thought about not going because you saw me here in the studio or if you're on the fence, I'm encouraging you to get in the place at 9 and 11, it's going to be a phenomenal day in the house of the Lord here in Jacksonville, Florida. And so today we're continuing part two of work in worship. I want us to read Ephesians chapter six, beginning at verse number five, and we're going to continue through verse number nine. Last Sunday, I got to verse seven, and today we're going to continue this thought as Paul is writing this letter to the church of Ephesus. I believe it's important for us to uh, have full context as we build out uh, these ideas and these life applications around this incredible book in the Bible. And so it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, bond servants, or your translation may say slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he or she is a bond servant or is free. Masters, Do the same for them and stop threatening them, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with them. Now, if this is your first week of us going through this passage of scripture, I want us to play some catch up a little bit because it's important for us to understand why Paul is utilizing this language, bond servant or slave and master. As I mentioned to you in the previous message, he's talking to a group of people in the church of Ephesus who fall in one of two categories. The first category that they may fall in is they may be a slave. Now, this word slave that Paul is unpacking and defining for us it may be different than the context of slave that comes to your mind. When I read slave, the first thing that I think of is what took place here in America. The tragedy and the heinous actions by evil men and women against certain races of people simply because of the color of their skin. When Paul is teaching us about slavery, he's not necessarily talking to us about people that have been kidnapped, captured, taken, held prisoners, beaten, some killed. He's talking about those who owe a debt. A better word to utilize in this particular context that would give you a greater understanding of who Paul is talking to. He's talking to indentured servants, those that may owe someone else money. And these people, they would work off their debt for six years, and the seventh year was known as a year of Jubilee, the year where all debts were cleared. And so Paul is talking to these people, and and these indentured servants, some of them, they had indentured servants or slaves or bond servants that were paying off debts to them. As a matter of fact, in the Roman Empire in this particular day and age, historians believe that there were more slaves or bond servants or indentured debtors than there were free people. Some estimate up to 60 million people were bond servants or slaves. And so Paul, he understands in this church that he's speaking to, in this church that he's writing, in this church that he's addressing, that the majority of this church may be either a bond servant or slave 
or a master. He speaks to the masters as well. And he utilizes a Greek word called kurios. This Greek word kurios means Lord. And he says something in verse 5 in Ephesians chapter 6. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters. The reason he says this is because a little bit later on in this passage of scripture, he utilizes that word kurios again, but he's talking about the Lord, our heavenly Lord. This is why we call Jesus the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. A better way of utilizing this earthly Lord is someone that rules over you or a manager or a boss. And so he's saying to the church of Ephesus and the people that he's addressing, when you are working, when you are serving, make sure you serve your company, you serve your job, you serve your boss, not just because you're serving them, but what you do is service unto the Lord. I want us to understand and really kind of dig deep down into this idea that we should work as worship. Our work should be a representation of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our work ethic should be a model and a reflection of who we serve. And our lives should be dedicated to making sure that whatever we produce, we're producing from the posture and the position of excellence. Not because we have to, but simply put, because we get to. Historical perspectives on work is that Jews saw work as noble, a character builder, while Greeks viewed it negatively. When Paul is teaching the church of Ephesus, he's talking to Christians and he's promoting work as a form of worship impacting one's testimony and their spiritual growth. And I want you to look at work from that context. And I know you may be watching this, wherever you may be watching this from, and work is not necessarily a positive thing for you, but you enjoy the benefits of it. And what I mean by that is, if you work a job, you enjoy the reward that comes from your work, which is money, that paycheck, that that direct deposit that hits. And you, you enjoy seeing those fruits, those harvests come from the seeds that you've sown. And I'm just encouraging you, let, let's bring it some priority today. This is what Paul is instructing us to do. Work is not just about the reward that we get from the work. Work is about actually making sure that our work is worship unto God. There's another passage of scripture that is in the word of God, and it says, whatever your hands find, do it with all your might. What that scripture means is whatever you are doing, whatever you're serving in, whatever area God has you in right now, make sure that it's a reflection of him. Now, I want us to take this moment to pause and ponder, okay? You may be in one of three positions. You may be working a job that you don't like. You may be looking for a job or in between jobs. Or you may be the boss or the owner and you have employees that you don't like. Whether you fall in one of those three buckets, I believe that Paul has a solution for you through the word of God. He tells those that are working, listen, I want you to work as if you're working unto the Lord. Obey your earthly masters. Be obedient to the things that God has called you to be obedient to. And so I want us to briefly go back over the applications that we saw and we found uh, last week. The first one is this. I want you to serve with sincerity, not just eye service. Now, how many of us have ever worked a job where we just did what we were supposed to because we knew people were watching us? Paul is encouraging us here. Listen, I don't want you to just work because you know people are watching you. I want you to serve with sincerity. I want you to work with sincerity. I want you to work like you are working unto God because God is always watching and God is always seeing if your life is a reflection and a representation of him. I said this and I think it would add value to say it again. You don't get success on credit. 
No, no. You have to make daily deposits. You have to pay for it every single day of your life. We live in a culture and a society that wants everything easy. All the, uh, of the majority of the food that we consume here in America is what we call fast food. There is a huge market for fast food because we want what we want and we want it, and we want it how we want it. We want everything convenient and fast because we are in that type of society and culture today. Success doesn't work that way. Success is not microwaved. You can't pop it in, put it on a minute setting, and then expect it to come out ready and prepare it for you the way you desire for it to be. No, no, success is placed in a crock pot. It's slow cook. It takes time to mature. It takes time for you to mature. It takes time for it to develop. It takes time for you to develop. It takes time to experience the type of success you dream of. Those pictures, those companies, that job, that car, that house, that condo, that apartment you have on your wall, those things don't just happen by coincidence. Those things happen because of hard work. And Paul is teaching us something I believe is so important in this passage of Scripture. Nothing that God desires to give us Nothing that God wants us to steward. Nothing that we will walk into as it pertains to a blessing or a season or a breakthrough or even uh, 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 that, that prayer that we've been praying. N none of those things we will retain if we don't steward them well. And so I want you to think about the things that God desires to bless you with, desires to have you steward, desires to have you walk into, and how you can be a good steward over those things to retain them. The second thing that we covered is this, work and serve from the heart, not just the handbook. This means you do more than just get by. You do more than just the bare minimum. You're coming in a little early and you're leaving a little late. You're making sure that everything that your hands touch is a reflection of the God that you serve. Because work is worship. And you have an opportunity to worship God with what you do. Verse 6, it challenges us to move beyond rule following and step into something called heartfelt commitment. The reason this is important is because in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 21, Paul is encouraging all of us to have what I call mutual submission. And this mutual submission that Paul is encouraging us to have, it starts off with us as brothers and sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters in bond, brothers and sisters in serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's telling us in order for us to have mutual submission, we have to walk in a manner that is worthy of the call of God that is on our life. And then he begins to speak to husbands and wives, and he tells us that these husbands and wives have this mandate to be accountable to one another. And being accountable to one another means for the husbands, protect your wife, cover your wife, and treat your wife as Christ treated the church. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. And then mutual submission for the wife is to be submitted to her God, Christ-fearing, christ fearing christ following husband. And then he begins to speak to the children and the parents about mutual submission. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And parents, steward your children well. And now he's teaching us from this position and this posture as we read the church of Ephesus letter from Apostle Paul that we need to understand what it is to have a heartfelt commitment to the work that we are working out and working through. It's vital. It's important. This genuine conviction is one of the greatest representations that we believe that God is a God of excellence. You know, one of the things that's hard for me, one of the things that's very difficult for me to process is so often the church 
is the last place that implements excellence in everything that it does. Think about your favorite company for a moment. Think about your favorite brand. Think about your favorite uh, a, a shoe brand or your clothing brand or, or whatever is your favorite restaurant or hotel. The reason those things have established the brand equity with you that they have established is because of a standard of excellence. My prayer is that the church would not just catch up, but the church would lead in this regard because we have have uh, begin to see a group of people understand and lean into the revelation that Paul has left us that work is worship. And as the world looks at our work, they know that we serve the true and living God because our mentality and our perspective is that of excellence through the gifts that Christ Jesus has given us. The third thing that I want you to write down, and this is where I want us to pick up, purpose over performance. God wants us to have purpose over performance. Instead of working to please earthly bosses, Paul calls for serving as unto the Lord. He calls us to lead our lives with integrity. He encourages us, do not chase the approval of people. I can remember when I first started pastoring. And I was 21 years old, 22 years old. And I would look for the applause of people. I would, I would feel good when people said, hey, you did a great job today, which feels nice. But the backside and the downside of that is I would feel like I had done something wrong or did not do enough when no one said that to me. And I found myself at 21, 22 years old, very quickly understanding if you live for the approval of people, you'll die emotionally when you don't get it. Paul is teaching us something I believe is not just a leadership lesson. He's teaching us a life lesson. And the life lesson that he's teaching us is to live and work and serve with purpose, not just performance. Oh, that's good, family. That's good. I want you to put in the chats, my life has purpose over performance. I mean, you understand that there's a purpose and a call and an assignment and an anointing and a grace on your life. It supersedes your ability to perform. Family, stages are given to performers, but platforms are given to purpose. There's a purpose on your life. And I know you may be without a job right now. I know you may have submitted application after application after application. You're like, Pastor, I, I, I'm just praying just to make it to the next month. And I'm telling you, you have a purpose on your life. Or maybe you're just working a job that gets you enough in income to get by to the next month. And you're working month to month, week to week. And I'm telling you, you have a God-given purpose on your life that supersedes the performance aspect of what you do and what you think you're not doing and what your job is able to do for you. There's a God-given purpose for your life. And I'm telling you, in this season, you're going to tap into it. You're going to step into it. You're going to walk into it. This is the season. Let me just speak this over you. This is the season that God is going to swing open doors on your behalf when you pursue him with righteousness, when you follow him with faithfulness, and when you do the work that God is calling you to do with diligence. God is going to swing open, fling open doors for you. And behind those doors are going to be favor, are going to be increase, and going to be provision. Why? Because God rewards those that diligently seek him.
It's in his Bible. That's the truth of the word of God. And so I want to encourage you, be faithful over the few things so that God can reward you with much. So I want you to say this with me. My purpose is more important than my performance. Come on, say it again. My purpose is more important than my performance. Family, if you live your life for the performance, it's a fleeting life. It's a life where you're chasing perfectionism. The two things that rob us of experiencing the grace of Jesus the way he desires for us to experience it is perfectionism and legalism. Those two things rob us of our God-given ability to enjoy, receive, live in the grace that Jesus has sacrificially given us. And so today I want to remind you it's not about your performance. It's not about how well you do something. It's about your availability to step into the purpose and into the plan that Jesus has for your life. Number four, invisible effort, visible impact. Invisible effort, it will lead to visible impact. This is what I call the integrity factor. What you do when no one's watching. Would you approve of your own work if no one else saw it? Would you accept your own work if no one else saw it? Would you think that what you have worked on, what you have completed, and what you have finished is excellent if no one else put their eyes on it? This is important. This is a heart check. This is, this is a great way for us to gauge the integrity factor of our lives. Invisible effort leads to a visible impact. Something I have written down here is this. Success isn't about what you're willing to work for. It's about what you refuse to quit on. When no one's cheering for you, when no one's applauding, when no one's patting you on the back, when no one's telling you, great job, well done, that's phenomenal. Are you still willing to work as hard and as consistently as you would if you were getting the applause, if you were getting the well done, if you were getting the good job? As believers in Christ, Paul is encouraging us, listen, work as you are working unto the Lord because your work is is worship your work it's ministry that this work that you are working through and working out and working uh, uh, towards it is worship unto god when the birds work they worship when the fish work they worship when the waves work it worships. When the wind works, it worships. All of these different creations that God has created, when they are working in the purpose and in the plan that God created them to work in and work out, they worship. Why are we the only ones that have a problem working in excellence as worship unto God? Paul is encouraging us bond servants and masters or better yet, employees and bosses work as if you are working unto God. Number five is this. Honor the mission, not just the manager. Ooh, that's good right there, family. 
because some of us, we work for the approval of the manager. We work because we want to get that well done, or maybe that raise, or maybe maybe that that new position in the office, that new uh, 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 that new corner that we've been hoping for. We work for the manager, but not necessarily the mission. I'm encouraging you to do what Paul encourages us to do, and that is work for the mission, not just the manager. Hear me, family. You either outwork your excuses, or your excuses outwork you. It's one or the other. There's no middle ground. Winners are too busy working to make excuses. Now, I I want you to just do some personal inventory. I want you to dig deep for this question I'm about to ask you. Are you a hard worker? Or do you have some room for improvement? Do you give it your all? Or is there some area in areas in your life where you know, "Mm, I need to surrender that. I need to submit that back into the hands of Jesus Christ because there's more that I should be doing that I'm not. And maybe if you are a hard worker, maybe if you are doing those things that you're supposed to, are you doing them simply because your boss wants you to? Or are you doing them because you know it's worship? to Jesus Christ, your Lord and your master. It's important for us to understand that when Jesus is our Lord and our master, we work in a manner that's excellent, that does not need the approval of men and women because we've gotten the approval from the one that matters most. Before I go to the next point, I want us to go back and I want us to look at verses 8 through 9 now. It says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he or she will receive back from the Lord. I want to say it like this. Whatever we do for God's house, whatever we do to build the thing that God has called us to build in this season of our lives, in this season of serving, in this season of working, God will in return do the same for us and that much more. Paul continues to write, whether he or she is a bondservant or free. Then it says in verse 9, masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening." knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. What is he saying here? He's saying if you are a master or a bond servant, the Lord of lords, the master of masters, the king of kings, is looking at how you either steward your position as an employee or he's looking at how you steward your position as a boss or or, or as a manager or as an owner. He's looking at these things. And Paul is reminding us that God is above all. He's above the masters. He's above the bond servants. He's above the bosses. He's above the owners. He's above the managers. He's above the employees. He's above all. And he's looking at how we are mutually submitting to one another. And he's looking at how we mutually submit to him. Which leads me to point number six. Our work is a mission field. It's a mission field. It's not about achieving necessarily the goals and hitting the markers and making sure that we do all the things that we're supposed to do and that's the pinnacle of our work life. No, no, it's about remembering that when we are 
in this position, we are on purpose. We are leading and living our life with the purpose. We understand that when we clock in, we give God glory. When we clock out, we give God glory. When we are, are working at our workstations and our offices and maybe in our cubicles and wherever we may be working, we are giving God glory and people are watching the way that we work. And so we have to understand and know what Paul is talking about. He's telling us, he's reminding us that our work is a mission field. And there's some of us that are watching this that need to be more faithful in the mission field, more faithful in the things that God has called us to, more faithful in the things that we have our hands on, more faithful to the places and the spaces that we currently work and serve in. If you're a leader, if you're a manager, if you're an owner, if you're a business leader, I want to encourage you right now, be a great encouragement to your team. You have an opportunity to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. You have an opportunity to model and walk out in front of the people that serve and build alongside of you what it means to be a leader led by the Holy Spirit. And this is what scripture means when Paul is teaching us, don't provoke, don't anger, don't belittle, don't bully those that work for you, those that work alongside of you, those that serve with you. I know, be a leader that lifts up, that builds up, that, that, that removes the ceiling from the people that are working alongside of you. Be a leader that encourages, that, emo that motivates, that inspires, that infuses hope in everyone in that company and watch how that company grows. You want your company to do better? Man, encourage your staff. Point them back to Jesus Christ. Infuse them with life, infuse them with hope, infuse them with strength, and watch how God blesses you and that company. It's an opportunity for you to walk out the values, to serve others, to build meaningful and mutual respect through mutual submission with those that work alongside of you. This is where I want us to land the plane. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9, Paul is teaching us to focus on the long-term impact. Paul's teaching emphasizes that work done with sincerity and heart is rewarded by God. Family, you should guide your life. You should guide your work ethic. You should guide your serving. You should guide your leadership by this understanding that you are focusing on the long-term impact, the character building, the personal growth, the ethical behavior, the things that matter in eternity versus the things that fade away, the things that are fleeting, the things that really won't matter. No, focus on the long-term impact. Focus on the fact that when you are working, it is worship to God. And I guarantee you this, your life will be so much better. Now, what I'm not saying is, that when you grind yourself to the bone and, and when you work hard, everything will work out the way you want it to. I'm not saying that, but I am saying we have a God-given mandate to work as if it is worship to God. And when we do that, God opens up doors for us. He showers us with favor. He allows us to see his word unfold and manifest in our life like never before because we are living and walking out the true and living word of God. And so I want to encourage you today. Apply this chapter, apply this passage, apply these verses to your life, work and worship, because it will change 
your life forever. There's a couple of things I want to do before we close. And I transition it back to our incredible Celebration Everywhere host. And the first one is this. I want to pray for those that are watching, that are leaning into this moment. That may not be walking with Jesus Christ. And you want to today. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I repent. And I ask you to forgive me from all of my sins. Cleanse me. Wash me from any unrighteousness and make me whole again. Right now, in Jesus' name, I confess with my mouth that you are my master and my Lord. And I believe in my heart that you are the king of kings, the savior of not just the universe, but the savior of me. And so today, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. The second prayer that I want to pray are for those right now that may be in a season where you're searching for a job or you're in a job that you don't like or you're leading people that you don't like leading beside. If that's you, I would just want you, if you're not driving, to lift your hands right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for divine favor. I ask you, God, to shower us in this season with your love and remind us that you're for us and you're with us. I thank you, God, that as we seek you first in your righteousness, that you would allow all these things to follow us, God. If we're in need of a job, allow jobs to follow us. If we're in need of a better job, God, allow better opportunities to follow us. If we are leading people, God, who have attitude problems, who have commitment issues, God, who, who don't understand this principle of hard work and what work ethic looks like, God, allow us to be greater leaders so that we can walk with these people until their season is up working alongside of us and bring in people, God, that will help us excel in the very thing you've called us to put our hands to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, family, I hope that you've learned something today from the Word of God for our studio sermon of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, Work and Worship, part 2. I hope to see you next week. Until the next time, I want you to know God loves you. And I love you too.